we are on the third septenary of the Arbitel of Magic, and this is the one where we are going to learn a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of the Olympic spirits. Aphorism 15. The spirits known as the Olympics reside in the firmament and the stars. Their purpose is to determine fate and oversee the occurrences that happen by fate with the agreement and permission of God. For those who seek refuge in the Most High, neither malevolent spirits nor unfortunate circumstances can harm him. Any Olympic spirits can teach or influence what is appropriate to their star, but something only can be accomplished with divine permission. It is God alone who enables them to achieve it. All things obey God, whether super-celestial, celestial, sublunary, or infernal. Therefore, strive for this. Let God lead you in everything you undertake, and everything will come to a happy and desired outcome. This is evident in the history of the world and daily experience. The pious find peace, but the Lord says there is no peace for the wicked. So fate means destiny, and destiny simply means destination. So the destinations that we want to desire are the ones that are approved by God. Why? Because God, or infinite intelligence, wants our happiness and knows how to bring us happy outcomes better than we do. So if we choose our own destinations for ourselves, we are very frequently plagued with problems. But if we allow infinite intelligence to choose the destination for us, then we are always happy. God's destinations are the only destinations that the spirits can lead us to. These Olympic spirits must obey infinite intelligence. Therefore, if we try to coerce these spirits to do something that is against God's will, we aren't going to have a very good time. So instead of dictating our desired destination to God, we should seek his guidance to determine the destinations that are meant for us. And that doesn't mean that we are going to have to give up our cherished dreams. That means that we're going to be able to embrace our cherished dreams because our cherished dreams are put there by infinite intelligence. Aphorism 16. There are seven governors or offices of the Olympians established by God to administer the entire universe. These governors, as mentioned in Olympic speech, are Aratron, Bethor, Phaleg, Och, Hagith, Ophiel, and Fool. Each of them commands a significant heavenly militia. Aratron, for example, controls 49 visible provinces. There are 196 Olympic provinces in the universe, each governed by seven governors. This is all elaborately explained in the book Astronomy of Grace. However, in this context, we aim to demonstrate how these princes and powers can be engaged in conversation. So the book mentioned is probably one of those lost books thought to have been written by Paracelsus. There is no trace of it anywhere. So we just told you that Aratron controls 49 visible provinces. Bethor governs 42. Phaleg oversees 35. Ok manages 28. Hagith is responsible for 21. Ophiel oversees 14. And Fool manages 7. Aratron manifests on the Sabbath day, which is Saturday, during the first hour of that day. He provides accurate answers regarding his dominions and inhabitants. Similarly, the other spirits adhere to their assigned days and hours. Each one of these spirits governs for a period of 490 years. The first cycle began 60 years before Christ's birth under the Prince Bethor's administration. This period, it lasted until the year 430. Phaleg succeeded him until the year 920, followed by Oak until 1410, 
Finally, Haggath reigned until 1900. So Ophiel is the governor of our current era until the year 2390. Aphorism 17. The seven governing princes can only be summoned through the practice of magic. They appear visibly or invisibly during the specific time, day, and hour they preside. This is made possible by using the names and offices assigned to them by God and by displaying their confirmed sigils, also called characters in this booklet, or the ones they have provided. Aratron the governor possesses the innate ability to control things natural to him, aligning with the astronomical attributes assigned to the power of Saturn. Additionally, he holds the following abilities of his own accord, instantly transforming any object, plant, or animal into stone while maintaining the outward appearance, interchanging treasures and coals, transmuting into each other, bestowing familiars with specific powers, imparting knowledge of alchemy, magic, and medicine, establishing harmony between subterranean spirits and humankind, even granting individuals a hairier semblance, granting the power of invisibility, granting fertility to the infertile, and bestowing longevity. Aratron governs 49 kings, 42 princes, 35 presidents, 28 dukes, 21 ministers who stand before him. He possesses 14 familiars and 7 messengers. Furthermore, he commands 36,000 legions of spirits, each consisting of 490 entities. Bethor governs the things attributed to Jupiter. He quickly responds when summoned to be elevated to high positions and gain access to abundant treasures. Bethor harmonizes the spirits of the air, enabling them to provide truthful answers. He facilitates the transportation of precious stones and enables medicines to work miraculously. Additionally, he grants familiars from the heavens and can extend life up to 700 years according to God's will. Bethor commands an impressive hierarchy consisting of 42 kings, 35 princes, 28 dukes, 21 counselors, 14 ministers, 7 messengers, and 29,000 legions of spirits. Faleg governs the domains associated with Mars, the Prince of Peace. By possessing Faleg's emblem, one's stature is elevated to significant distinctions in matters of warfare. Ok governs the celestial realm and bestows 600 years of vibrant health and boundless wisdom upon its followers. This illustrious governor imparts the most exquisite spirits and guides us to perfect remedies. With Ok's divine touch, all that is ordinary transforms into pure gold and precious gems. Those who bear the mark of his favor are worshipped as gods by kings worldwide. Ok commands a legion of 36,536 spirits, each diligently serving under his dominion. This incredible being rules with unparalleled authority, tending to all matters of existence. Hoggeth governs matters of desire and passion. When one embraces his essence, they become radiant, adorned with incomparable beauty. In an instant, he transforms copper into gold and gold into copper. He presents loyal spirits who dutifully serve their devoted recipients. He reigns over 4,000 legions of spirits, assigning kings to each thousand for their designated periods. Ophiel holds the position of governing over matters associated with Mercury. He commands an impressive legion of 100,000 spirits, readily granting familiar spirits to those who seek him. He possesses vast knowledge and is capable of teaching all arts. Furthermore, those privileged enough to bear his mark will gain the extraordinary ability to transmit Quicksilver into the revered philosopher's stone instantly. Fool can transform metals into silver, both in words and actions. He governs lunar matters, heals dropsy, and bestows water spirits that serve mankind in visible form. Under his influence, humans can live up to 300 years. 
The following are the fundamental principles of this secret knowledge. Every governor, which are the Olympic spirits, so each of those seven Olympic spirits are called governors, every governor operates using their spirits either naturally in a consistent manner or freely as long as God doesn't intervene. Every governor can perform tasks that occur naturally over an extended period using prepared materials or achieve them instantly using unprepared ones. For example, Oak, the prince of solar matters, can create gold through natural processes, alchemical techniques, or by magical means. So sometimes your help will seem like it would have just happened anyway, but other times it seems miraculous and comes out of nowhere. One type of manifestation is not more potent than the other, however. So you don't necessarily need to ask for a miraculous manifestation. You allow those manifestations to happen as the spirits do them, because they are following infinite intelligence's will. The true and divine magus can command all creatures of God and enlist the services of the world's governors. These governors obediently respond and carry orders, but only with God's authority, just as Joshua commanded the sun to stand still. Joshua also works potent weather magic in that same scene in the Bible. With average magi, the governors will send their spirits to obey within certain limits. However, false magi will not be heard and be exposed to the mocking demons and various dangers as witnessed in Jeremiah chapter 8. So that means depending on the character of the person performing the magic, one will either have exemplary results, limited results, or disastrous results with their magic. And that all depends on you and how you're approaching it. You want to be an exemplary magus, not an evil one or an average one. And how you do that is by following the guidelines as set forth in these aphorisms from the very first lesson. The seven governors and their hosts exist within all the elements, moving harmoniously with the motion of the celestial spheres. The lower elements always depend on the higher elements, as philosophy teaches. And at the end of this lesson, I will give a little bit more of an extended understanding of what they are alluding to there. True magicians are born with innate ability, while those who enter the field voluntarily are unfortunate. John the Baptist refers to this when he says, No man can do anything of himself except it be given him from above. Regardless of the purpose, every character or sigil a spirit provides possesses its efficacy within the designated time. However, it must be utilized on the same day and planetary hour it is given. God and your soul are alive. Uphold your covenant, and through the revelations the Spirit grants, you shall obtain everything, for all the Spirit promises will be accomplished. Basically, they're saying here, do your part, and God will never fail to do God's part through those spirits. Aphorism 18. Other names are given to the Olympic spirits by others, but only the ones revealed by the spirit, whether visible or invisible, are effective. These names are predestined for each individual and are referred to as constellations. They usually have an effect for around 40 years, hence it is safe for the young art practitioners to work solely with the spirits without using their names. If they are destined to attain the art of magic, the other aspects of the art will naturally present themselves. Therefore, pray for steadfast faith in due time. God will bring about all things. So, they are alluding to the fact that the spirits of the Olympics also, in addition to the names provided in the text, have unique names, which really are best revealed directly by the spirit to the magician, and that doesn't usually happen right at first. That takes time working with them. However, the names given in the text for the Olympics are always helpful, so you can just use those names for now. You will also over time, and it's saying over a long period of time, you will probably be given your own names to be working with those spirits that nobody else can use but you, and that will take time for those to manifest. Aphorism 19. 
The inhabitants of Olympus willingly appear as spirits to people, offering their services. However, be aware that evil and destructive forces may also approach, driven by the envy of the devil and attracted to the sins of wrongdoers. To establish a friendly relationship with the spirits, one must avoid serious sins, seek protection from the highest power, and thus avoid the traps and obstacles set by the devil. In fact, God can even bind the devil himself into service for such a magician. So, all we have to do, it's saying here, to avoid the traps that our own ego sets for us to fail, is to desire to avoid falling into error. asking constantly for help and guidance from on high, and that spirits can even use our mistakes, quote, sins, to help us. Everything is under God's will. So as long as you are working first with infinite intelligence and constantly asking for guidance rather than making up your own mind all by yourself, you are destined to succeed. Also, another note about magicians are born, not made. This is alluding to the fact that you wouldn't even be interested in this course if you weren't born a magician. So you don't have to worry about that. You're in the right place doing the right thing if this is something that you are innately drawn to. Aphorism 20. All things are possible to those who believe and are open to receiving them. However, to the skeptical and unwilling, everything appears impossible. There is no more significant hindrance than a wavering mind, fickleness, inconsistency, foolishness, excessive talking, intoxication, lust, and disobedience to God's word. Therefore, magicians should be pious and upright, true to their words and actions, have unwavering faith in God, and desire wisdom in divine matters. So first and foremost, we must seek infinite intelligence. If we do and follow how we are directed to proceed, we will never fall into any of the distractions that are listed in this aphorism. And don't take this as sort of like a Catholic guilt lesson. It's just you don't want to be distracted from your work, from your magic, from your path. And those distractions, as they are listed in the aphorism, are just ways that your ego wants to delay your progress. And you're not going to do that. You're not going to allow yourself to do that because you're going to remember to follow the path as set forth in these aphorisms. Aphorism 21, Calling the Olympic Spirits. To call upon any Olympic spirits, observe the sunrise, and consider the nature of the spirit you seek. Say the following prayer, and your desires shall be fulfilled. So you also want to have that sigil or character drawn and ready to go when you're doing this. Then you say something to the effect of omnipotent and eternal God who has ordained the entire creation to be praised and glorified and for the salvation of mankind, I humbly request that you send forth your spirit, then you name the spirit, of thee, then you name the planet, order. May they enlighten and instruct me in the things I ask of them. Or may they bring me medicine for ailments. However, not my will, but yours be done, through Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, our Lord. Amen. Remember to keep the Spirit for no more than one hour, unless the Spirit is familiarly connected to you. Then when you're done, and it's time for them to part, you say, Since you have come in peace, answering my requests peacefully, I thank God in whose name you have arrived. Now you may depart in peace to fulfill your orders. Return to me when I call upon you by your name, order, or office, which the Creator grants. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 advises, Do not be quick to speak and do not be hasty in your heart to utter a word before God. After all, God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. As a dream comes through many cares, so the speech of a fool comes with many words. So it's talking about vain babbling in prayer or in magic is not productive and neither is too much busy work. So earlier it was talking about all of the different legions and this and that. This is the a, a Renaissance magical concept known as the great chain of being. And it suggests that everything in the universe is interconnected. 
forming a complex hierarchy from the creator at the top to inert matter at the bottom. This worldview was inherited from ancient occult schools, and it categorizes each species or object as a separate link in the chain. Higher links possess greater intelligence, mobility, and ability than those lower down. The higher links exercise authority and responsibility over the lower ones. For example, plants have authority over minerals, drawing sustenance from them, while animals have authority over plants and minerals. Humans, in turn, dominate the natural world and have authority over plants, animals, and minerals. The position of each species on the great chain depends on the balance between spirit and matter within its composition. The more spirit and less heavy matter, the higher its position. Even within each category, some beings or objects are higher or lower than others. For instance, gold is considered the highest metal whereas lead, containing less spirit and more matter, occupies a lower position. Alchemists aimed to transmute lead into gold by infusing it with more spirit, while philosophers sought to elevate their lower natures into spiritual attainment. This worldview emphasizes the interdependence of everything. It asserts that each human being is a microcosm reflecting the totality of the universe. Ancient scholars believed that matter consisted of four elements, air, fire, water, and earth, corresponding to the human body's four humors. These humors, linked to the seasons, must remain balanced for good health. Although the theory of the four humors has yet to be scientifically followed, we recognize the importance of maintaining a balanced lifestyle to stay healthy. The wise theory of the great chain of being teaches us that the Creator continually creates diverse beings. This results in a universe filled with every imaginable kind of life. All species are linked through evolution, forming a ladder extending from the lowest existence to the Creator. Humans occupy a middle ground between nature and angels, connected to angels through understanding and affection, but liberated from attachment to the material world. This chain also represents a ladder that all beings can climb through reincarnation, ascending from the lowest state to the highest. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of a rundown of the theory of the great chain of being, because that's where a great deal of the Arbitel's magic rests, as was the case with a lot of Renaissance magic, but even some of the medieval magic uh, hearkened to that idea as well. This is the end of septenary number three, and there's a lot going on here, so make sure that you take a look at the handout, familiarize yourself with these sigils and the different planetary intelligences from Olympus. Understand that in this particular system, the planetary day is the first hour of the day. So from sunrise for one full hour. In this particular system, that's when you work with the spirit. Now, at the end of this course, I will also share with you what my teacher in angel magic, who also is the one who first introduced me to the Arbitel, taught about how to use the planetary hours and the angels along with the Olympic spirits. But I'll do that after we complete the entire Arbitel so I don't start to mix things up too quickly. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today, and we'll see you next week for the fourth septenary. Until then, blessed be.